medicine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so do you want to start the lecture? Okay. All right. So today we will talk about coagulation. Mm -hmm. All right. So probably one more question. Which of these diseases are known as to be royal disease? A, a hemophilia, B, um, disseminated intravascular coagulation, C, vitamin K deficiency, D, idiopathic thrombocytopenic uh, panic, purpura, thrombo thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. And would you like to tell me why you answer A or B or C or D? A. Uh, would, would you like to tell me why? Who would say A? Okay, uh, <laughs> Lê Phương Thảo, you can go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Yes, uh, uh, hemophilia, I know that the, the royal disease is the hemophilia A in family in UK. Uh, um. That's uh, the disease uh, is link connect uh, is link chromosome. Mm -hmm. I I know it. I I think so. Okay. Yes. So when you say X linked, what does that mean exactly? Um, it's link is uh. So does it affect uh, men or women if it's X linked? Oh, uh. The woman will uh, uh, the disease uh, usually uh, uh, usually uh, occur in uh, a man. Mm -hmm. If it's X linked, you know, why is it only in men? Uh, it's more often in men than women. If it's X linked. So when you say X linked, um, so. So a female have two X chromosome, right? right? And uh, a male have yeah, a male have an X and a Y. So if the X is you know defective, the men only have one copy. So that's why if they have the defective copy of the, the, the gene, they become uh, you know diseased. But if the female have two X chromosome, one of them is crappy or one of them is bad. The other one is still good, uh, which means that you know um, she's not really doesn't show symptoms at all. So that's why uh, they they are carriers. So they doesn't really have the disease. Uh, they just carry that genes, and you know uh, when they pass it to the son um, because the sons only have one X. So that's why if they get the defective uh, genes, they will have the disease. Um, so you know you're right. Uh, so these are. What do you think of hemophilia as a royal disease? Because it affects mostly kings, um, and it's actually have a long history. If you can go to the answer. So for this uh, class, uh, you guys can you know um, type in the uh, question in the chat, and I will try to uh, answer it. Okay, and then why hip is given the lectures. All right, so uh, just uh, talking about this um, this pedigree right here, right? So uh, this is the excellent disease. So you can see um, majority of the male getting a disease, right? The male is, uh, I swear, the blue square right here, more dominant compared to a uh, female, female, uh, yes, area. All right, any questions for this slide? Uh, what, uh, should I move on? Okay. 
So uh, let me ask you a question. How is Xlin, um is different from a recessive, you know, like an autosomal recessive disease? Does anyone know? Okay, Hib, do you know what's the difference between, uh, you know, an Xlin disease versus uh, autosomal recessive? So uh, with the autosomal recessive, that means uh, you re you require um, two two effective allele in the order to have a uh, defect. Mm -hmm. With the X uh, with the excellent disease, you only need one. Now with the excellent, um, it's more likely to happen in the male because male only have one X, yeah. and the uh, female have two X. So if uh, the if the, the normal X will have the normal protein expression, so it's not more like it's not likely to have a disease compared to the uh, male. Okay, yeah, that's that's perfect. Uh, so the hemophilia is they call the rotary disease is actually because it's connected uh, to Queen Victoria. Um, so she's from the Queen of England in nineteen, uh, I mean eighteen thirty seven. So. That is when the first the disease was first um, you know linked back to so and people think that her uh, mutated gene was actually a spontaneous uh, mutation um, so nobody knows why she had it but she was the first one to carry the genes and once she had that gene she's passed it down to all her sons and uh, her daughter was carrier so that uh, one day the royal uh, family they marry off to you know other uh, royal families in Europe. That's when the genes start to spread, um, and that's how the gene is keep uh, become you know a carrier and a carry throughout the European uh, countries. So that's why a lot of uh, European um, these you know sort of uh, uh, countries have a lot of hemophilia. All right. So mm -hmm. we're talking about a hemos, uh, hemostasis, right? With the hemostasis, a main job is to stop bleeding. So there is two um, uh, two stages for the stop bleeding. The first um, um, mechanism is um, to have um, to uh, uh, that's called primary hemostasis. The main problem, the um, the main function of the uh, primary hemostasis is to to have a platelet. Platelet will aggregate together and form a plug, but that plug is uh, very um, unstable and uh, it's easy to, to re remove. So we have to have the fibrin. Fibrin uh, that is the uh, secondary hemostasis. So fibrin we will uh, uh, create by the um, enzymatic activation coagulation cascade. So that's, that's cascade will happen to call to uh, form a fibrin and fibrin will form with the platelet to have the final and ultimate um, uh, stable clot. Okay, so uh, actually, uh, uh, Hip, you want me to, to take through the first uh, stage, okay? Uh, primary hemostasis. So when you know when you um, sort of injure yourself, um, basically there were two processes that occur right away. Uh, so the first one is primary uh, clotting uh, and the secondary uh, hemostasis. Uh, so uh, I try to simplify it. Um, so the primary uh, hemostasis I just remember as a platelet flux. Uh, so um, so remember primary hemostasis. Uh, it has to do with the platelet. Uh, so platelet is a cell. A function to you know, only do one thing uh, to clot your blood. Um, so the platelet plug is kind of like a whimsy um, uh, plug. Okay, it's not very strong. Uh, its function is to help clot your blood right away, uh, but it it can sort of you know um, block uh, being brushed by the blood, and then it can cause it to bleed to restart again. Uh, so if you ever you know scrape yourself, uh, and then you found that there's a blood, a little blood, and it clot in your skin. Uh, that is a plated plug, and then if you just run your finger across it, it will kind of you know fall off right away. So that that is why uh, we need to have a stronger uh, sort of like a like a mesh to like help uh, stabilize that plug. Uh, so that's why we have the secondary hemostasis. 
So that is the second part, which is a fibrin clot, or sometimes people call it a fibrin mesh. So if you look at the pictures uh, on the left, uh, so the first pictures, it just tell you that is a platelet flux. Uh, so that, those are the aggregations of the uh, thrombocytes, uh, which is the platelets. Uh, so platelets, also uh, another name for platelet is a thrombocyte, uh, um, thrombocyte. Uh, so you see those little plugs over there, they look very flimsy. Uh, they sort of like, it's just like, uh, you know, um, it, it, it doesn't look that strong. Uh, but any of you guys that work in the lab, uh, when you take the fresh uh, blood out and then you spin it, uh, you will get three sort of, um, you know, layers. So the first one is a plasma, so it's clear. This is some middle pictures now. Uh, and then the second, um, you know, sort of layer is a, a fibrin clot. Uh, basically, this, this is a fibrin clot. And then the last part, which is a red blood cell, would be at the bottom. Uh, so if you take a tweezer and you take out the fibrin clot, uh, it will be the pictures on the right. So this, this right here is the middle one. You see how it's like, it's a lot more tougher. It's like a gel uh, sort of. Uh, so it's a lot tougher than just the uh, little clot over there compared to the platelet flux. Uh, so the fibrin clot is what help uh, limit the, uh, the, the blood from, um, you know, from bleeding. Um, so that is a secondary hemostasis, okay? So we go to the next slide. So I'm gonna tell, talk about the first uh, process uh, when you're, you know, first kind of injure yourself. How does, you know, a blood clot form? Um, so there's a lot of process that occur uh, when you uh, injure your blood vessel. Uh, so when you talk about blood vessel, uh, there are some cells that kind of layer within the blood vessel. Uh, we call it the endothelial cells. Uh, so the endothelial cell functions normally, they have a lot of functions because uh, they have to prevent the, the, clot, the blood from clotting normally. Uh, if not, then, you know, all of which is bleed or, you know, blot, clot everywhere. Uh, so in a normal uh, blood cells, um, they have a lot of functions and a lot of uh, kind of mechanism uh, to help the blood from clotting. Uh, so a lot of them are depicted here, but uh, just walk you guys through it. Uh, so the first thing is when you uh, basically damage the blood vessel, uh, the first thing that happens is that uh, you expose uh, you know, your blood to the underlying collagen. And once you expose the, your blood into the underlying collagen, uh, it's signal, it's formed like a signal to uh, tell your blood is that you know, there's, a, there's a leakage here that we need to pluck it up with uh, you know, this platelet plug. And how does that happen? Uh, so first is a von Willebrand factors, uh, which lie under underlining the uh, collagens. Uh, so when your blood is exposed to the von Willebrand factors, it sort of bind to the uh, platelets, and it help uh, the platelets to kind of clot. And so it call, it form a uh, they call it as a platelet uh, cascade. Uh, so when the platelet is activated, it releases uh, other uh, you know uh, agent to help uh, signal and other platelets to come. Uh, to that platelet so that you form a platelet flux. Uh, so a lot of signaling, uh, you know, release. So one of those two that they release is the granules, uh, which is ADP and from, uh, 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 thromboxin A2, uh, and it form uh, this uh, platelet flux, uh, and it pluck up those uh, temporarily whole, uh, you know, in the leakage. Okay, so I'm going to go in deeper a little bit uh, to explain the process of the uh, platelet. Okay, if you want to go to the next slide. All right, so yeah. uh, so with the endothelium, right? Mm -hmm. They have the um, the main function is try to uh, uh, have prevent a um, clot. So with the healthy cell, they will, will release the uh, anticoagulation factor to be, uh, prevent blood clots like um, not just oxide, uh, uh, prostate uh, cyclin, or the um, a uh, end and then uh, um, ADBase to decrease the AD ADP because the ADB right here will activate uh, platelet aggregation. And whenever your endothelial cell is injury, they will release the uh, procoagulation factor try to promote uh, blood clots because we, we don't want to, uh, we want to uh, stop bleeding. So endothelial cell will release the um, factor eight and uh, um, one will be brain factor. Uh, let me see, do I miss anything now? Um, 
Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so just one more thing about, uh, you know, like the endothelium is very important because uh, normally, you know, you don't want your blood to clot, right? So they have to have this, all this mechanism to prevent the blood from clotting. And you recognize that nitric oxide is, remember when you have chest pain and people give you nitroglycerin, it's the same mechanism. So it's a nitric oxide, so it causes the blood to kind of, you know, dilate it. And the reason why uh, you want your blood vessel to dilate is, you know, to keep the uh, blood flow to a maximum. Uh, so when your injured cells is kind of, you know, when you first injure your, uh, your blood vessel, the first thing they want to do is that they want to, you know, uh, slow down the, the blood flow uh, to, you know, to help uh, like clot uh, the, uh, the blood. So the, the very first thing when you cut your blood vessel, that what they do is they call it vasogenic uh, vasoconstriction. So the blood uh, the blood vessel will automatically constrict to re uh, restrict the blood flow and then they release all these factors in order to help the blood from clotting, uh, to, to help the blood clot uh, easier. Okay. All right, so with the platelet, right, platelet, um, the main job of, of platelet is to form the uh, platelet blood formation. So, uh, Go back to the uh, this area right here. Whenever you have the endothelial damage, the collagen will be exposed, and um, um, one really brain uh, factor will bind to the uh, collagen, and um, this collagen will um, the the our, our pilot will bind to the um, our pilot will bind to the um, one really factor with um, GP uh, one, GP one P, right? Yeah. Wait, so, uh, yeah, this right here. So you see the, uh, the, the the black right here. That is the um, GP one P by with the um, one believing really factor, and um, that's you activate the uh, uh, bladder. And when you activate the bladder, they will change the conformation and they will re release the uh, ADP calcium and um, thromboxane. The calcium, the calcium later we will try to help for the coagulation cascade in the secondary tumor spaces. And um, thromboxane will help for the platelet aggregation. And um, the ADB right here will help to activate the um, um, P23A receptor. And this, re uh, this receptor right here will uh, link in with the fibrinogen that to be with the, another uh, pilot. So that is the um, primary hemostasis. Okay. So uh, I want people to remember the structures of the platelets. So any, uh, so any cell line, you sort of have to remember what they do. So white blood cell, you think about fighting infections, right? And then when you think of the platelets, think of you know, blood clotting uh, right away. So uh, the structures of the platelet is quite uh, complicated. But the three uh, main uh, you know, structures that I want you guys to remember is basically this. Uh, the first one is that uh, this receptor right here, which is they call it the glycoprotein 1B uh, because uh, it does have some functions. Uh, it is bind to the von Willebrand uh, disease, uh, von Willebrand factors, which is lie underneath the endothelial. Uh, so sometimes people with, uh, you know, um, inherited disease uh, like uh, familial uh, bleeding they have problem with this uh, receptors so that you know they cannot the platelet cannot bind uh, to the underlying um, uh, von Willebrand. brand so that means there's no fat you know there's no uh, platelet aggregates so the blood won't clot uh, so that's the first structure that you need to remember so that's one so it's one b uh, that's the one and then the second one is a two b and three a uh, so this one is very uh, vital in in sense that it's help uh, recruit other platelets and uh, so that you know and it, it binds to other platelets with via fibrin uh, notions but I just want you to remember that the 2B and 3A is required for uh, cross-linking of the platelets uh, together and then the other thing that you need to remember is that the platelets uh, they release granules and the two important things that they release in the granules is ADP and the uh, von Willebrand factors uh, so step one will always test you those uh, so the, why do they release ADP? Because ADP is actually one of the uh, target for the drug site. Uh, so that's why you need to know that it released ADP. Uh, 
Um, and the von Willebrand factor is also the other reason uh, is because it helped uh, with, you know, cross-linking uh, with the underlying uh, uh, endothelium. Uh, so just remember the structures of the platelets and what it do. Uh, so remember that is, you know, the 1B is, is binding to the von Willebrand factors. And then uh, 2B and 3A is help cross-linking with other uh, platelets. And then the uh, secretion of the dense and alpha granules. Uh, so remember the alpha granules contain von Willebrand factors and the dense granules contain the uh, ADP, which is needed, uh, uh, you know, needed for platelets activations uh, later. Okay. So uh, we keep talking about von Willebrand factors. So what exactly is von Willebrand factors? Uh, so it's sort of like a very large uh, protein. So it's uh, when you look at the, you know, the your endothelium is look like this, right? And then the von Willebrand factor is just sticking up like this, like fibrin. Okay, what does it do? It help catch, uh, you know, those platelets that uh, your blood flow uh, flow, and then the platelet will stick to this. Uh, little, you know, uh, large proteins. Um, so that's why it needed for the blood to clot. And uh, very interesting about that is that uh, the mobility factor, usually it clung together like a ball like this. Uh, but when, uh, when there's a shear stress, uh, so like the blood, you know, the faster the blood uh, flow, the sticker, uh, you know, it become. Uh, so when it's become stickier, it, it become like a fimbriae. So it's just sticking out into the blood to help catch those uh, platelets that, you know, pass through. All right, so uh, yeah, just, um, just uh, mentioned about that, the glycoprotein, right? So uh, as we mentioned earlier, we have um, glycoprotein 1P, mm -hmm. glycoprotein 1B right here, we were, um, it's uh, uh, black pilot to express glycoprotein 1B and protein 1B will bind to the um, von Willebrand factor. So if we have, you can see in the um, growth, um, GP1P, that is called um, Bernard Solar Syndrome. And if we have the deficiency in the um, one really brain factor, that is called one really brain disease. Mm -hmm. And if we have a, a, deficiency, a deficiency on the GP2P and 3A, that is called Glensman disease. And all of these three the deficiency have uh, increased the ability increase bleeding time because the main problem of the main uh, function of the pilot is to um, stop bleeding. So whenever the blood is not working, when we will have uh, increased bleeding time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why I, I need you guys to remember the structures of the platelets because every defect uh, and you know these will cause a disease and these diseases are also tested on step one. So you have to remember the structure. So the best way to do it is just draw out, uh, you know, like on a black, on a whiteboard, just draw out the platelets and then you draw out the GP1B, uh, which binds to the von Willebrand factors. And then you draw the other one, uh, which is the GP2B and 3A, which bind together uh, with other platelets. Um, and then also have that, uh, you know, ADP uh, releases by the platelets. Uh, so because each target is a target for the drug site. Okay, talking about uh, drug target size. So uh, after here we have aspirin, right? Aspirin mm -hmm. is the um, COX-1 inhibitor. So when we, we, in, we when you inhibit COX-1 inhibitor in the platelet, they will uh, stop making um, thromboxane to, mm -hmm. and we know thromboxane to relate to the uh, uh, platelet aggregation. Mm -hmm. and, um, the the ADB. Um, the ADB is uh, the, the main function of the ADB is to, uh, to uh, activate the platelet uh, for the uh, uh, platelet co uh, conformation and is, express the um, express um, glycoprotein 2B 3A. So when you inhibit the ADB inhibitor by uh, uh, clobidogrel, that will have uh, no platelet aggregation. And um, with the um, and another target drug is we, we can also target to the uh, glycoprotein 2B uh, 3A. So when we target this um, it, this receptor, the platelet cannot link to another platelet. 
So that's also result to the no playlist aggregation. So the final result is no playlist aggregation and income increase, increase living time. Okay, so uh, this this slide is very important with you uh, in terms of uh, taking the test because this is how they're going to test you, uh, you know, the function of, of the drugs on each side of the playlist. Uh, so you need to remember the aspirin is a COX-1 inhibitors and then you need to know that, you know, those drugs called Plavix, uh, when somebody have a stent uh, put into, you know, like the coronary, they always put them on a anti-dual playlist, uh, so which is aspirin plus Plavix. Uh, so you have to understand the mechanism under, you know, underlying uh, why they have to give aspirin and then why they have to give Plavix at the same time. Uh, so you need to remember those two. And then the, the last one, which is a glycoprotein 2B and 3A, not very, you know, a lot of people tested this because it's not that important and then uh, people usually don't use it uh, in clinical uh, medicine. So that's why not a lot of them are tested, but definitely aspirin and uh, Plavix are well tested every single time because uh, it's part of the anti-dual playlist, uh, which is probably is going to be used a lot more in the future uh, for cardiovascular disease. All right, so um, talking, uh, so we already talking about um, primary hemostasis. So it's all about platelet um, formation. So the second uh, one is the secondary hemos hemostasis. So we're talking about the uh, 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 fibrin clot formation. So uh, so this um, uh, fibrin, uh, fibrin clot formation is a result of um, a um, coagulation cascade. And all this um, factor is uh, synthesized by liver. Uh, so that's why when you have a liver, pro uh, liver problem, it's also increased um, uh, bleeding, uh, incredibly bleeding time to so we have in here we have changes and F changes and uh, in changes like from uh, 12 11 11 9 8 and F changes it's a uh, 7 to 10 and the common pathway is from 10 to 1 and uh, I just want to uh, mention like uh, a factor 8 and um Factor, the, the factor A and uh, one really brain factor is uh, being synthesized and released by the endothelial cell. And the rest of the factor is uh, by synthesized by liver. And, um, and uh, we, later we also introduce a drug will target this pathway, try to, um, to have some anticoagulant. Anti -coagulant. And um, the main the main problem is try to uh, uh, synthesize fibrin mesh stabilize pilot clubs. You want to add something? Uh, so yeah, so uh, this is very important because they always tested you. Uh, then what you need to know is that just remember the extrinsic because it's easier to remember. There's only one factor that involved in it, which is number seven. When I think of extrinsic, I think lucky number, which is, you know, number seven. If a lot of you go to the casino, you will remember that. So seven is a lucky number, so it's extrinsic. And just remember the, uh, the common factor pathway, which is number 10. So 10, if you see two multiply five, which is 10, uh, so there's a common factors. And uh, just remember factor two is thrombin. Uh, just just remember that because you know nobody remember factor two, but uh, just remember factor two is from them. Uh, so the whole the whole idea of you know extrinsic versus in intrinsic is that uh, the coagulation pathway, the final pathway will activate thrombin. And what does thrombin do? So thrombin convert uh, fibrinogens, which is soluble. So that why it's not good because it's soluble, mean that you know it will dissolve in your blood. Uh, so you want to convert from a soluble. Uh, sub substance into insoluble substance, which is fibrin. So fibrin is like a mesh, you know, it's harder and it doesn't dissolve. So that's why the whole idea why you need to convert something soluble into insoluble. Um, so thrombin would be the, is the thing to remember. So, uh, so 
uh, at the uh, primary uh, hemolysis, we have the platelets, right? Platelets uh, try to fill up all the uh, um, the gap right here, and um, the uh, fibrin clot try to stabilize, um, try to stabilize and uh, make sure uh, the uh, uh, blood vessel um, neutral fill of a red blood cell is not um, leaking, uh, le leaking in. Um, Leaking away from a uh, vessel. All right. So um, in our body, right? In our body, we want to have a balance between bleeding and um, thrombosis. So um, in um, so with the coagulation cascade, we already go over that. Coagulation cascade is. Um, from two uh, pathway intrinsic and extrinsic, and the final and after intrinsic and extrinsic go to the common pathway, and the um, the common pathway try to making fibrin mesh to stabilize uh, platelet blood, but at but but um, later we also need to uh, dissolve fibrin clots, so we also need another pathway help us to solve this fibrin clots, that is the fibrin no fibrin fibrin no lysis. So um, plasminogen will be activated by the uh, plasminogen activator to become plasmin, and this plasmin right here will go to uh, um, the clots and degrade the, the, the um, fibrin into the uh, D dimer. So in a clinical uh, uh, situation, you can also measure uh, the diameter to whether to see you have um, uh, a ray of the degradation. And uh, the, in the fibrinosis, it's trying to dissolve the clots and restore blood flow as well as um, promote good healing. So I think that is the final step, right? I'm sorry, what? So do you want to add something here on this slide? Okay, so uh, just one thing I want to add, you know, so when you think about uh, when you first injure your blood vessel, your, your instinct is to stop the blood clot. So you form this, uh, you know, this fibrin mesh, but you also don't want the fibrin mesh to like, you know, grow too big and that would block off the blood flow. So that's why we need something to break it down. Um, so that to prevent, you know, the blood from clotting uh, to a point where there's no blood flow anymore. So that's why it's a balance between uh, clotting and then uh, breaking the clot at the same time. Uh, so just remember, thrombin help uh, to clot the blood. So thrombin, uh, we convert fibrinogen into fibrin, uh, but you also need to remember that plasminogen convert into plasmin, uh, which is to break the fibrin clots. Uh, so try to study them pair in pairs. Um, so that's a, the best way to study. So remember, uh, thrombin activate fibrinogen into um, fibrin, and then we have the plasminogens convert to plasmin to break up the clot, and it's activate uh, via plasminogen activators. Uh, if you guys are familiar with TPA, uh, when you think about uh, if you have a clot in your brain and then they, they want to do a TPA, so that's where it comes from. So it helps break the clot. Uh, so uh, TPA stands for tissue plasminogen activator. Uh, so that's where it comes from. Okay, so um, it also we also talk we also continue talking about the uh, fibrin node lysis. So another another pathway like from last slide we already talking about the tissue plasma nodes um, activator that uh, to you to degrade the uh, fibrin mesh. But uh, we also have another pathway that also help us for the uh, anticoagulant. That is a that is a protein S and protein C. Mm -hmm. Right, so the, this protein S and protein C is a uh, cleavage and inactivate factor um, um, five and factor eight. So when whenever you have inactivate the factor five and, and factor eight, that means you also uh, inhibit the coagulation cascade. When you inhibit coagulation cascade, that means you don't make the uh, fibrin match. So that is another me mechanism mm -hmm. to uh, uh, help us for the anticoagulation. 
and um, in here, if the factor of five, it has some mutation, uh, that, that's called factor five laden mutation. So whenever the factor five has a mutation, that means they will cannot be inhibited by uh, uh, protein C. So that it will lead to the farming clot, and this clot is uh, we we could we could not uh, give uh, protein C to uh, de degrade the uh, uh, factor five because factor five is a uh, right now it is already mu mutated and uh, protein C cannot degrade factor five, and that's it leads to the uh, farming clot. So the, the so, factor V is very confusing because there's another disease called factor V deficiency, uh, which means that you, your body is lacking factor V. Uh, so that's why you have, I have trouble keep like try to remember them. Uh, so the way I remember is that factor V laden, I, I call them like a super factor V, like a super factor V mean that it just keep clotting like crazy. Okay, so that mean factor V laden uh, mean that you clot like crazy. Versus factor V uh, deficiency mean that your body is missing the factor V. That means that your body won't be able to uh, form a blood clot, so you're bleeding. Uh, so there's the two separate problems. So just try to remember there's two separate: the factor V laden versus factor V deficiency. All right. So um, what to remember? Right? So this is like a, this slide is like for a text message. Mm -hmm. So uh, PT is the, for the intrinsic pathway. Uh, with the intrinsic pathway, we only have um, factor seven. And um, whenever you hear about intrinsic pathway, you have to think about the P PT. Uh, that is also another um, name for the intrinsic pathway. And um, intrinsic, intrinsic pathway is the, it's a, have more factor contribute to the uh, pathway, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. And whenever you see this number, you have to re re uh, remember in thinking about PTT. Uh, if any factor in here in uh, this pathway is not working well, then, then they will increase P uh, PTT in common pathway. And um, coagulation cascade also requires calcium and vitamin K. Um, with about calcium, uh, we remember uh, this calcium can uh, help. This calcium also contribute to uh, activation of the uh, um, coagulation factor. Like, um, let me see, uh, factor um, in here I see like factor nine, factor eight, factor ten, and factor, uh, factor five is the required for the calcium. Mm -hmm. And uh, and um, other factor is two, seven, nine, and ten. It um, require vitamin K. So whenever we have uh, you have vitamin K deficiency. It's also will relate to the uh, um, clot formation. Okay. So just a quick question for all of you guys. Uh, who usually presented with a vitamin K deficiency? Anyone knows? Who is a population that you know you worry about vitamin K deficiency? Where is vitamin K produced actually? Anyone know? Can I say? Sure. You go ahead. Is that in the gut? Around yeah. the gut? Mm -hmm. Yes. And also um, someone who takes So who, who produces vitamin K? I know it's in the gut, but like, what produces vitamin K? Bacteria. Okay. So it's bacteria in the gut. Yeah. And why is it relevant? So which populations uh, usually... Like, I don't know like population in age, but I know like whoever taking um, aspirin and whoever taking antibiotic at risk for vi uh, vitamin K deficiency because... Huh? Yeah, I hear kids running in the background, so that's why. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, is it yours? <laughs> <laughs> not my kid. Okay. I'm not married yet. Okay. Thanks God. Okay. Um, that's my niece and nephew. But uh, okay. what I learned, mm -hmm. what I learned is just a few days ago, a yeah. um, uh, who, the pop, whoever take vitamin, uh, take antibiotic are at risk mm -hmm. for um, vitamin K deficiency, and also who take like ever anticoagulant, it also mm -hmm. like that because the anticoagulant, especially like aspirin, mm -hmm. working on uh, 
of of warfarin actually warfarin will yeah, be warfarin, not, um, not, yeah yeah yeah, yeah aspirin so, is another mechanism yeah. but warfarin work by blocking the recycle of reduced vitamin k so mm -hmm. it's gonna affect serine protease factor mm -hmm. two seven nine ten mm -hmm. and it's affect the whole cascade so whoever take warfarin and antibiotic will be at risk for vitamin k deficiency okay and uh, why why do people take antibiotics at risk for vitamin K deficiency? Because you kind of wipe out the gut flora. Okay, you wipe out the. Okay, yeah. so that's that. I, I just want to get to the bottom of it. And then, who's the other population that you worry about vitamin K? Uh, you know, like when a baby is first born, that you worry about vitamin yeah. K deficiency. That, that's why they have to in, 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 um, have some injection to vitamin K to a neonate. Yeah. So they don't have the, um, the, the normal, uh, normal flora yet. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So uh, when a baby is first born, they're not exposure to any bacteria yet in the gut. So that's why sometimes you, know, you have to give them vitamin K if there's some bleeding problems. That's the first thing you want to think about is vitamin K deficiency. Okay, so that's, that's, that's all you should know about vitamin K, you know, just neonate. And then people take antibiotics um, because it wipes out their normal flora in the gut. So you worry about bleeding. Rarely happen, but, you know, it's just something that they always test you on the exam. Okay. All right. We can go to the next one, uh, which is the anticoagulation drugs. Uh, so these are the drugs that are very important. Uh, and these are tested very um, frequently. So you have to know the mechanism and the side effects of these drugs. So the first one is warfarin. Uh, I think everyone knows what warfarin is because so many people use it. Um, so uh, like Kato said earlier, it's blocked the vitamin. So I think of warfarin as a vitamin K uh, blocker. So it blocks all the vitamin, all the uh, coagulants um, that you know use vitamin K uh, as a cofactors. And uh, a fun fact: Do you do how do people know uh, what warfarin? How was it first discovered? Anyone know how how people find out uh, vitamin K? I mean, uh, warfarin. I have no idea. You know? No. It's actually, uh, it's a uh, rat poison. Mm. So it, yeah, mm. it's a rat poison, and people uh, it's some somehow like you know uh, they poison some rats, and and then they like oh whoa this one can actually. Uh, use as a, a blood thinner. So it's just some extra things. Um, so that's why a lot of rat poison, they cause a rat to like bleed to death. Um, so, uh, so warfarin is the first one. And then uh, heparin is the second thing that you have to remember uh, the mechanism. So uh, heparin, uh, probably not for step one, but you have to, there are two types of heparins. There's a uh, low molecular weight heparin and then there's an unfractioned uh, heparin. Uh, clinically, they're used a little bit differently. Uh, but uh, for the purpose of step one, uh, you just need to remember that, you know, uh, heparin, uh, you know, work by activate the antithrombin. Uh, so the antithrombin, uh, the main function of antithrombin is to inhibit uh, factor 2A and factor, uh, factor 10A. And um, the difference between the two is depends on the um, renal uh, sufficiency. So if the patient uh, doesn't have any renal uh, problem, then you can use um, Lovenox, which is a, the other name for low molecular weight heparin. If the patients, you know, have um, sort of uh, AKI or uh, renal insufficiency, then we use unfractioned heparin. Um, they work a little bit different uh, from one another, but mainly they act via the uh, antithrombin. So that's all you need to know for step one. Uh, and then the next drug is a direct thrombin inhibitor. So remember, uh, thrombin is two, uh, so factor 2A. So you block factor 2A. Uh, then there's no, uh, uh, you know, clotting. And then the next one is uh, direct factor 10A uh, inhibitors. So these are a little bit easier to remember because it's actually have the name. So, uh, and you know, a pixaban, uh, which is aliquis. Uh, so if you look at the name, it's have XA in it. So that means you remember it's factor 10. Uh, so the two uh, common uh, traded name for it is aliquis and serato. Uh, so you see it all the time uh, in clinical uh, practice. So just remember uh, the medications and how does it work um, because that will be tested on the exam. Okay, so this is sort of like a slide that I just put together so that you, you know you sort of remember uh, the you know coagulation pathway. 
uh, and then uh, you see that the mechanism action of uh, low molecular weight uh, versus you know the uh, unfractioned heparin. Uh, so I don't think that you need to know this for um, uh, purpose of step one, uh, but it's more uh, for clinical practice uh, because you know uh, each one of them is different. Uh, so Lovenox uh, versus you know like the regular heparin uh, versus you know. Um, so I, I'm not going to go in too deep into it. Uh, but basically it works at a different site. Uh, so one of them, uh, low molecular weight uh, heparin. Uh, so if you look at this one, uh, so unfractioned heparin, when I think of unfractioned, I think of like a very sort of uh, crude heparin. Uh, so it's not really refined. So it will work on both uh, factor A, uh, factor two and also factor 10. Okay, so that's why, that's why we call it unfractioned. So uh, it just worked by blocking everything. But low molecular weight, uh, if you look at the pictures, it can only uh, bind to factor 2a uh, and it's sort of, uh, you know, spare uh, the uh, factor 10. Um, uh, so it's mainly a, a factor, mainly a fact factor 2. And then the, uh, and the last one, which is found in Perinex. Uh, so that one is a little bit more different. It just, it's more potent than the low molecular weight uh, heparin. Uh, so these are used uh, very common uh, in clinical practice. I just put it in there, but I don't think you need to know for uh, step one at all. Uh, a little bit too uh, deep into uh, step two um, uh, knowledge. Okay. So uh, let's do this question. Uh, so this is sort of pretty easy, but uh, I want you guys to get, uh, you know, understand the, the underlying mechanism. So um, what is a possible underlying problem uh, with the patient described in the pictures? And can anyone tell me what is a clinical term that you would use uh, if you see a patient with this sort of uh, pictures. So what exactly is going on in the pictures? Do we have anyone want to answer it? All right, I'm just gonna pick one, okay? Uh, so let's see, uh, Min, you wanna give it a, a try? Um, and so it's I, because the patient has bleeding in the mucosa, so mm -hmm. it, uh, it's uh, it could be I. Em nói tiếng Việt được không ạ? Yeah, yeah. Em thấy bệnh nhân bị xuất hiện ở da và niêm mạc thế nên là thường thường nếu xuất hiện ở bên ngoài như thế này thì sẽ là bệnh cho chức năng của tiểu cầu. Mm. Okay, so what is the uh, the medical term that you would use to describe uh, the first pictures? What would you, uh, you call that? Patochia. Yeah, so I it's called, yeah, it's called petechiae. Uh, so it's like a petechial hemorrhage. Uh, so a very pinpoint is sort of like uh, someone take a needle and just stab you and then you, you bleed just a little bit. So it's a very characteristic of uh, platelet dysfunction. So in a lot of disease, uh, when you see this particular uh, you know, hemorrhage, you think about platelet dysfunctions, okay? Um, so I think, I think you are correct uh, in terms of uh, the question will be A, uh, platelet dysfunction. And the second one is a mucosal bleeding, uh, basically. It's just bleeding from the mucosal area. Thank you. All right, so let's go with the next questions. So in this questions, uh, I wanna see what do people call this? And then what do you think is an underlying problem? Okay, so I'm gonna pick somebody else, okay? Uh, let's go for, uh, uh, is it Cam? Uh, is it Cam or Cam? You want to give it a try? Uh, let's say uh, go to Yong. You have you have two Yong. I don't know if it's Yong or Yong. You know. All right. So uh, let's say okay, Le Phương Thảo, you can go ahead. Or you don't. Yes. I think I do. I will to be. Coagulation factor deficiency. 
Okay, and why do you think it's B? Why is it not A? Um, and this picture, I I can see it. Um, MRI from um Jones. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, is he a lot of um? I think uh, um, uh, deficiency is up. Uh, coagulation factor is not um vascular or blood list. Okay. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. So the only reason why I just do this question is very basic. So if you have problem with your platelets, uh, you are more likely to have sort of particular and mucosal bleeding. And when you think of somebody have very deep bleeding, you know, like bleeding into the joint, bleeding into the muscle, uh, then you think about coagulating factor deficiency. Um, so that's that helps you a little bit. You know, someone is bleeding, you need to know whether it's a mucosal bleeding or is that bleeding into deep tissue. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we go to the next one. If you want to go to the next slide. All right. So okay. this, yeah, go ahead. Just go ahead. Um, all right. So um, uh, this all of the uh, primary hemostasis, right? So um, they have some problem with their playlist. So we have to uh, find out um, where is a problem. Is. So it is either to have the uh, low platelet count or to either platelet um, is uh, not function normally. Mm. So whenever you have the low platelet count, you have to find out whether the platelet is uh, under production. That's mainly we call aplastic anemia or uh, increased destruction. Or they um, have something to do with the uh, spleen. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So let me uh, explain to this one a little bit. Um, so. When you think of a bleeding, when you look at the, you know, uh, the patient have particular hemorrhage and then mucosal bleeding, you think about platelet problems. So there's two problems that could happen to a platelet. Uh, first thing is that you don't have enough platelets or you have enough platelets, but your platelet is sort of like not functionally wise. Uh, so it's like a crappy, really bad uh, platelet. Uh, so you have a low platelet count, uh, usually either whether it's that your bone marrow is not pushing out enough platelets uh, so that's why the, the top differential would be a plastic anemia or someone could have cancer. Um, so because their bone marrow is not producing enough uh, platelets, uh, then uh, also they're not producing enough red blood cell, they're not producing enough other, uh, other cells. So that is a clue for you to say that don't they, your bone marrow is not uh, producing enough. The second problem with the uh, platelets is that it could be for some reason your body you know, destroy a lot of uh, the platelets. Uh, so the three diseases that always go hand in hand uh, that we always think about when you have a low platelet is ITP, TTP, and HUS. Um, and it's sort of very complicated to go to each one of them, but uh, I can give you a quick pictures of ITP. It's, uh, it's usually uh, idiopathic, mean that it just happened out of the blue. Uh, usually a female that come in and just have low platelets, uh, low plate, you know, platelets usually doesn't have any symptoms, uh, just sort of like a little bit bleeding, uh, and then you do the platelet count, it's, it's low, but no other symptoms. TTP is a little bit more severe, uh, usually people are a lot sicker, and uh, I think uh, when you think of TTP, people remember about the, that pentat, uh, you know, like the fever, uh, anemia, and then they have thrombocytopenia, uh, and sometimes they have like neurological uh, symptoms, like they are very, uh, you know, they have ultimate status. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, they have a, a sort of renal problem with them. So that's kind of like a picture is for TTP, very sick. Uh, so sick patients and HUS is the same things, very sick patient. But uh, these, when you do a lab uh, cow, you will have a very low uh, platelet uh, alone. Um, other uh, cell I usually just normal. And the last one is the splenomegaly. Uh, so the reason why um, you know, people have splenomegaly is because of the platelets. Uh, it get so usually platelets are clear. All uh, platelets are clear by the spleen, uh, and if your spleen cannot get rid of the platelets, it sort of build up into your uh, your spleen, and your spleen get larger and larger and larger. Um, so that's why uh, some people who have you know their spleen taken out, um, their body cannot clear the platelets, so that their platelets could be like in a, in a very elevated. Um, so uh, sometimes that's why you see the, the, the increasing number of the platelets. Uh, and then the second thing is a, a platelet dysfunction, meaning that your uh, platelet is not really functioning uh, you know, normally. So basically, 
think about a, a playlist, but the structure is not really working. So I think we talked a little bit about earlier about the structure of the playlist. Uh, so you think about the glycoproteins, you know, 2A, um, you know, uh, 1B, and then 2A and, uh, uh, and 3. Uh, and then also with the von Willebrand uh, factors. Uh, so just think about that. And also acquire uh, your, your platelet can be, uh, you know, can become dysfunction with uh, drugs uh, and also uremia, uh, high level uremic, uh, uremic uh, um, and especially in patient with like uh, uh, renal problems. So that's just something to think about. Um, okay. All right, so we go to the next slide. So uh, this is the objectives uh, that I want you guys to sort of like remember through the lectures. Uh, so when you think of uh, primary hemostasis, uh, just remember the platelets. Uh, so the function of primary hemostasis is to form a platelet flux. So remember platelet flux is kind of like a flimsy uh, plug, you know, just, just hold, sort of like help temporize uh, the blood, uh, but it's not really, uh, you know, uh, really strong at all, very flimsy. So that's why you need a secondary hemostasis. Uh, which is like a fibrin mesh, so uh, like a mesh, so it's help uh, catching other platelets. It catch a lot of, uh, you know, like the neutrophil and other blood cells, uh, so to form like a mesh, so it's a lot stronger. And then uh, recognize that uh, healthy endothelium uh, and also injured endothelial cells have different function. Uh, so when your cells, uh, normal healthy endothelial cells, they have function is to prevent uh, the, the, the blood from clotting. And how do they do that? So they do that via, you know, nitric oxide, uh, to help uh, dilate the, uh, the blood vessel, prostacycline, and then ADP pace. Uh, so you remember ADP, it helped uh, sort of, uh, you know, help the platelet uh, uh, from aggregating together, and ADP pace, uh, which is ACE at the end, uh, which means it's an enzyme that cleaves the ADP. So without ADP, uh, your platelet cannot, uh, you know, uh, like coagulate together. So that's why, you, you know, you're, you're uh, less likely to form blood clot. And then when your uh, endothelial cells are injured, uh, they start producing this uh, coagulating uh, factors. So ADP, thromboxin A2, uh, von Willebrand factors, and then factor eight also helps uh, with the uh, coagulation cascade. And then remember the uh, difference between the extrinsic and intrinsic factors. Remember extrinsics only have one factor you need to remember is factor seven, and then common uh, pathway, uh, which is the factor 10, two, and factor five. And the intrinsic factor is everything else. Uh, so you think of 8, 9, uh, 11, and 12. And how do you measure them? Uh, so you, you measure the extrinsic uh, pathway via PT. Uh, so the mnemonic for is that it wept. Uh, so when you think of wept, think about warfarin. E stands for intrinsic, uh, extrinsic fact, uh, pathway. And PT is a prothrombin uh, TAM. And then intrinsic pathway is, you know, the heparin. Uh, it's a fact factor 8. 9, 11, 12, and then you measure it through the PTT. And remember, uh, when you read a question, try to separate it, whether it's a superficial or it's a deep uh, bleeding. So it's a superficial, you think about platelets uh, problems, and it's a deep, uh, you know, like deep uh, bleeding, then you think about coagulation factors uh, right away. So this help you kind of, you know, uh, narrow down what exactly is a problem. Okay. Uh, so um, let's see if uh, people can do a case presentations. Uh, that's the end, right? If, if it's at the end? Yeah. I think yeah, there's another slide. Yeah, no, a slide about uh, it's like bleeding disorders. Uh, so this is like kind of like a summary. Uh, so go back to one slide. Sure. Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, when you look at the, uh, so superficial bleeding, think about platelets. Uh, so what could go wrong with the platelets, right? So you think about deficiency in the glycoprotein 1B, then you think about bernard sylvia syndrome, uh, then the other glycoprotein is 2B and 3A, and then you think about Glanzman disease, and then uh, thrombocytopenia is sort of like autoimmune and your uh, platelets have been destroyed, so you think ITP, TTP, so those are a little bit more uh, further in step two. Uh, step one, they usually don't test that. And then coagulation disorders, that's when you have like deep bleeding, you know, bleeding into your muscle and your tissue. Uh, so you think about hemophilia, always think about hemophilia when you see a deep, uh, you know, bleeding problem. So there are three uh, hemophilias, so A, B, and C. Uh, so the ways to remember that, uh, uh, so when you say hemophilia A, it sounds very similar to eight, uh, which is number eight. Uh, so 
instead of saying hemophilia A, you just can you can say hemophilia eight. Uh, so just remember that. So A and then B is nine. Uh, so remember A and B are excellent recessive. Uh, so that means that you will see it's more common in uh, uh, in male uh, versus um, you know uh, female, uh, sort of like a von Willebrand disease uh, instead of like male, which is. So when you see a bleeding problem, like a coagulation disorder, if it's a male, then think about hemophilia. Uh, and then if it's a female, think about von Willebrand uh, disease. Uh, and uh, also think about vitamin K deficiency. Okay, so uh, the next, next slide I want you guys to remember is the drugs, uh, which is very important and it always tested. Uh, if, can you go, yeah. So remember the mechanism and where each, each of these drugs acted on. Uh, so remember aspirin, uh, it will act on the COX inhibitors, uh, so there's no platelet activation. And remember the Plavix, uh, right? So Plavix or Clodipogrel, uh, so it acts on the ADP uh, receptors, so there's no platelet aggregations. Uh, last one is a glycoprotein uh, 2B and 3A, uh, so uh, abscissimab, uh, not really tested, but just remember the way I remember or I first say a mnemonic for is uh, abscissimab, so the middle of the six is uh, the product of 2B uh, multiplied by 3A, so it becomes six. So you just remember, you know, uh, 2B, 3A, abscissimab. Uh, and then the other uh, target for the coagulation cascade is warfarin. Uh, so remember, warfarin act on vitamin K, just remember it's as vitamin K inhibitors. And then uh, heparin act on the antithrombin. And then the um, thrombin inhibitors, and then we have the factor 10 inhibitors, which is abixaban and uh, uh, Zorauto and Aliquis. Okay, so that's all I want you guys to remember. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, so anyone have any questions so far? Okay, so we can go to the uh, uh, you know case presentation now that you know a lot more about uh, you know uh, bleeding disorders. Uh, so we're gonna have a little bit more fun with the case presentation. So I think uh, uh, Le Phuong Tao, you have a case, so you wanna um, sort of, you know, present it to us? Yes. Okay, you wanna share your screen? Do you know how to share the screen? Um. So there's a bottom, at the bottom, it has a share button and you can share your screen. I, I don't know okay. the way to share my screen. Okay, sure. Um, so let me use my screen, okay? Let me see. Did you add anything new to it? Yes. Okay, you want to send it through Facebook for me and then I will uh, share it for you? Oh, uh, yes. Sorry, guys. Anyone else have any case to present? Okay, all right, I got it. Okay, give me one second, okay? Okay, all right, you can go ahead. Uh, let me see. Yes. Can people see it? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, go ahead. Um, hi, um, I will talk about a uh, presentation case. I want to introduce uh, the situations um, about 
hemophily come to a hospital. Um, a baby, a patient is 10 years old, um, of old male, mm -hmm. who came to my hospital because of pain as well as left and was spontaneous. Mm -hmm. It started about eight hours before and then he knows treatment. He doesn't use medicine, but it's more and more swelling and pain. And his family decided to bring him to go to the hospital. Um, past medical history, he has a immobility five years ago. He has usually come, come to hospital because of swelling John. He hasn't had a trauma before and no surgery before. Um, his family has no body immobilia, but his family grandpa, mother, has mother, brother, were immobility B. Um, he has a not allergic to medicine and um, foods. And um, he is called exam. Um, and you have been next slide. Mm -hmm. He's called an exam. Uh, right side is normal. He is. Um, Uh, both, um 19 times per minute, uh, respiratory rate 24 times per minute, uh, mm -hmm. temperature uh, 37 degree, SpO2 98% on room air, no edema, no blessing under the skin. Um, he feel pain as well as less and more very much, but it in no heart, no red. Uh, but um, restrictions of movement. Um, about the low system, he was alert, alert mm -hmm. no signs of meningitis. About cardiovascular system, bones were clearly CRT um, lower than two seconds. Heartbeat were clearly no murmur. Mm -hmm. uh, respiratory, respiratory system is normal. Um, GI system. No permitting, yellow mm -hmm. spoon, soft abdomen, liver and spleen was large. Uh, Renditor, urinary normal. And mm -hmm. um, laugh. I am, um, he was just meditate, blood count is normal, coagulation is normal, and more ultrasound, free fluids, fitness in the joints, um, and bowel is very right normal. Um, assessment nine factor um four point two percent plus what O and uh, as a um positive and um assessment plans um this he um was this uh, main disease hemophilia B accompany accompanying Disease in no uh, complication, MRI sources, left and bone, and then here, uh, uh, just uh, fresh frozen plasma, uh, color group, um, 15 mil per kg time, and then uh, within uh, three days, um, I finished my oral presentation. Okay. Mm. I only uh, interview the situation of okay. about MOVLB uh, mm -hmm. come to hospital. Okay, so yes. I have a couple questions for you first, right? So yes. you diagnosed the patient with hemophilia B. So, you know, the patient already have a diagnosis of hemophilia B already. So that's why the yes. case is a little bit straightforward. But let me ask you this. So if hemophilia B, so what exactly is the underlying uh, problem with hemophilia B? Mm. What's what's wrong with people with hemophilia B? Anyone can answer. What? So what is the mechanism of hemophilia B? So what is the underlying oh, yes. mechanism? Um, I um, yeah, I um. So okay, so does people with hemophilia uh, have problem with uh, deep bleeding or? Uh, superficial bleeding deep bleeding okay so yeah so when they have problem with deep bleeding what what uh, you know problem is affecting is that the platelets or is that coagulation pathway 
coagulation cascade. Okay, so coagulation pathway. So when you think of hemolytic B, you, what factor are you thinking about? Nine. Oh, B, nine. Nine. Right? Factor nine. Okay, so what's wrong with the factor nine? They don't have enough factor nine, right? So when you did your lab, the coagulation is normal. Yeah. So when you say coagulation um, normal, is that the PTT, PT, you know, all the bleeding oh, yeah. is normal? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, can, I see, can I see a slide number three? Coagulation in this patient with just um, mm -hmm. PT and um, IPTT. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's normal. Um, oh. No, no, no. IPTT like is normal. Slide number four. You want to see slide number four? Yeah. Yes. Which one? Let me see. Yeah. Hang on. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the coagulation is normal. Yes, it's in my mid test. Okay. I think so. Oh, I'm, I'm just asking, can the patient have, you know, hemophilia B uh, or hemophilia disease and their, uh, you know, PT or PTT is normal? So if the, if the lab is abnormal, which do you expect to be abnormal, PT or PTT? APTT. APTT, okay. Yes. Okay. Co like coagulation factor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. And then uh, on your physical exam, there's one thing that I uh, wonder, right? So if the patient has swollen in their uh, elbow, what else are you worrying about? Or oh, elbow or knee? What? Okay. So if the patient has swollen in the knee and in the elbow, what else are you worrying about? So there's some bleeding, but you know, any complications of the bleeding? Any problem yes. with the bleeding into the joint or into the muscle? In the joint? Yeah, if you don't treat them, right? It keep bleeding. What what will happen? Um. Maybe the patient will have compartment syndrome. Wow, I didn't expect that. But th that, who answered that? I want to see it. Is that, uh, is that Main? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Main, you wanna uh, you wanna clarify the compartment syndrome? Uh, I think when the patient have breathing in the muscle and mm. it will muscle in the other organs. So, yeah. So what structures you know uh, within the muscle or the joints? It's a nerve, right? You're thinking about the nerve. So if, if like if the swelling is so much and it presses on the nerve, so it causes the muscle to become paralyzed. And sometimes patients like can feel uh, the skin, you know, they have paresthesia. So that's why uh, when someone with hemophilia come in with like joint swelling, we always worry about compartment syndrome. Uh, you got to make sure that they can feel their toes, they can feel their hands, uh, they can function, you know, they can move their hands or their toes. So that's the other uh, exam that we always want to check. So, so that's why I want to bring back to your um, presentation. So uh, the HPI is good, but I, I, I think that you could do a little bit more, um, you know, so you can actually uh, sort of add a little bit more, like when did it happen? It happened eight hours ago. And then what happened, you know, like does the swelling get worse, uh, you know, and what, like, and then for the past medical history, you can actually include it into the HPI. You can say the patient is a 10 years old male. Uh, hang on, sorry. Let me, okay, so, uh, so the, you can tell the patient is a 10 years old male uh, with a past medical history of hemophilia B who presented with uh, left elbow uh, pain, you know, and then you say uh, it started about eight hours ago. Uh, he didn't use any medication and the swelling got worse. And then, you know, he was brought into the hospital uh, by the family. And then you have to go to the, uh, the other part, which is the review system. Uh, I feel like um, the review system is very important, uh, especially in cases that you don't know what's going on with the patient. So review system include, you know, any weight loss, any fever, uh, uh, just general, you know, like neuro exam, you know, uh, and then cardiovascular, you know, and then uh, you also think about 
rash, right? You want to ask about any other rash anywhere else in the body, you know, any weakness uh, or numbness in the arm or the knee. Uh, so you want to include that also. And then uh, for the past history, you want to ask about uh, the surgical has, uh, history, past medical history, uh, family history, and then any medication. Uh, and then also, uh, since this is a case of like 10 years old, you want to ask about the delivery, you know. Um, was it a normal delivery? Uh, did, the, did the kid, you know, grow up with uh, meet all the milestones? Uh, so that's something that you just have to include uh, uh, in the past uh, history a little bit. And then for the next one, a physical exam, like I said before, uh, you need to include uh, the neuro exam for the, uh, for the elbow, for the arm, uh, to see if there's any involvement of compartment syndrome at all. Um, and then uh, the other trick is that if there's nothing wrong with the exam, you can say uh, the physical exam is completely normal except for, you know, he has some pain and swelling in the left elbow, okay? So you don't have to say the whole thing like neuro is normal, cardiovascular is normal, okay? So just say everything is normal except for this, okay? And then the lab is can fine. I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, can I have a quick question? So sure. in case of like bleeding disorder, do you mm -hmm. ask risk for cardiac tamponade or no? Like the blood? Uh, not yeah. in this case, because if you have cardiac tamponade, uh, tamponage, uh, so basically you bleed it into your heart uh, and you will have other symptoms, you know, like hypotension and mu like muffle heart sound. Um, so not necessary, uh, but you, if the patient have like symptoms and you, you just have to like do the exam that you think yeah, uh, yeah. relevant to, you know, the patient. So usually but, you have, um, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, but like, I'm, what I mean, are you at mm -hmm. risk? Like, if you have hemophilia or bleeding so disorder, mm -hmm. are you at risk to develop a cardiac tamponade, tamponade or tamponade? Yeah, to be honest with you, uh, I'm not sure, but I wouldn't expect them to bleed into the, you know, like the around the heart. Okay. So, yeah, I, I haven't okay. seen one, but you know, I'm not very experienced. But most of the time, I see people bleed into the joints and the muscle, but not usually in the heart. I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank okay, you. Yeah, I feel like you. Have you have to uh, you have to uh, damage the um, the, uh, mm -hmm. the you have to damage the wall of the heart in the order to the blood if you into the very cardiac right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. you have to damage the heart in the order to blood the field into the very very mm -hmm. So it is, um, I don't think like it will really happen. Okay. Okay. And I, I have a question for, uh, you know, Le Phuong Tao, right? Since you present this case, is there any other uh, diagnosis you think about uh, besides hemophilia B? Because that, that's sort of the fun of being, you know, medicine that you have to think about all the disease, right? Not just one. Uh, yes. So no, what, what else do you think about when this, uh, you know, young patient came in uh, with, you know, like bleeding into the joint? Um, I think um, in this case, if we um, miss a case, patients come to, come to see me mm -hmm. about um, a pain as well as bone. The first, I uh, will just a more. Um, um, it's I think it's um, have many reasons. First, um, um, history of patients. Um, and mobility. Uh, and the first, I think um, the first diagnosis. And then, um, um, besides, I will have to think about other reason. Yeah. Um, so, just, what other reason? What other disease that you think about in this case besides um, hemophilia B? Um, maybe uh, arthritis. I'm thinking about, uh, so you think about this, it's like a bleeding into a deep joint, right? You think about coagulating um, factors, okay? So what other, you know, places that, you know, coagulation cascade could have problem? So you think about vitamin K deficiency? You think it's possible? Uh, vitamin K? No. Yeah. I think the patient is 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but what if he has some, you know, like uh, take some uh, antibiotics earlier and now, it, now his gut normal is completely changed and he lacks in vitamin K. So my question is that if a patient with vitamin K deficiency would have the same symptoms as this person? If um, he um, vitamin K deficiency, um, 
think he can uh, spare a uh, blessing under the skin. Okay. I, I, I don't think uh, uh, the problem from vitamin K or platelet or uh, vascular because platelet is um, in the joint. Yes, um, it's, it is not a pure skin. Mm. Yes. Okay. All right. So, like for the future, I want people when they present, uh, I want them to think of a differential uh, diagnosis. You know, just just not just one, but think about what out there that you know. So, what in this case thing uh, make you think is hemophilia B um, versus vitamin K deficiency? You know what I mean? Um. You asked me. Yeah, no, I'm just saying, like in the future, you know, I want people to think of other diseases, not just uh, yeah, not yeah. just one. I know. All right, but uh, good job with that. Okay, thank you uh, for bringing the case. Okay, uh, so we have like half an hour left, um, so I'm gonna show you guys some questions and then uh, just go through what we study today, and I, I hope that you guys uh, under you know kind of remember what we talked about today. All right, so all right, so let's see. Okay, so uh, let's do question one. So I'm going to read the questions, and then you guys can try to answer it. Uh, so we have a 24 years old female uh, who presents to the ED because of her menstruation uh, lasts longer than usual and she feels dizzy and weak. Her labs show that her uh, von Willebrand factors is, you know, uh, level is abnormally low. Uh, what do you expect to find in her labs? So she, will she have a normal PTT, normal PT, normal platelets? Um, so anyone can try to answer, including hip and uh, uh, they will increase uh, PTT and increase uh, bleeding time. Okay, can you explain? Uh, so, uh, in, because the uh, increased bleeding, bleeding time, because the one really brain, uh, one really brain factor contribute to the platelet aggregation, right? That so when the one really factor is not working, the platelet aggregation is uh, um, not happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, one really, uh, one really brain factor also contribute to the act activation of the uh, factor eight. So when you don't have the factor eight, you will increase uh, uh, PT pathway. Okay, so factor eight is uh, intrinsic or extrinsic? Factor eight. Let me say, factor eight is uh, intrinsic pathway. Okay. So oh, uh, PT. PTT. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so you say PTT is abnormal, right? Yeah. PT is normal. How about the platelet count? Yeah. Yes. The platelet count is normal also? Yeah. Okay, so what do you think this patient has? What's the underlying disease? What's the name uh, of the disease that she's having? One, one really brain disease. Okay, all right. All right, so that's the only thing that I want you guys to remember is that von Willebrand disease is that is carry factor eight uh, also. Uh, so you know, factor eight is intrinsic pathway. Uh, so that's just one thing you just remember. All right, so question two. Uh, so let's say a sixty years old man who present to the primary care doctor with palpitations, and then uh, his other uh, disease he has uh, significant for hypertension and diabetes. Uh, so the patient has had you know, palpitation in the past, and he's on a anticoagulation medication. And when they uh, did the EKG, it showed that he has an irregular, irregular uh, rhythm uh, with no detectable P waves. Uh, so which of the following is a mechanism of a uh, action of the anticoagulation therapy uh, that the patient uh, is taking? Okay, so first thing first, what do you think is a medication that the patient is taking? Um, the patient can take uh, warfarin. Okay, and who who say that? 
Yeah, uh, my name is Hoàng Vũ. Okay, Hoàng Vũ. And uh, why do you think the patient is taking a uh, warfarin? What is the patient having? Yeah, I think patient has an atrial fibrillation okay. in the eye. Uh, and how do you know that patient have uh, AFib? Yeah, because yeah, you say that the EKG shows that uh, mm -hmm. the irregular uh, apremias with uh, no T wave. I, I, I have said that. T waves, okay. Right. Uh, that's perfect. So yeah. uh, now that you know the patient is taking warfarin, so which would be the answer? Um, so I think. All right, what is warfarin? A? Is the anti. Uh, you, you know, I, I don't see the, the scene. <laughs> I don't see the slide, so I, I oh. cannot choose the... Wait, you uh, can't the, see the slide? The, yeah, I can't oh. see the slide. Can you see the slide now or no? No, no still. Still, I don't see the slide. All right, hang on. Oh, yeah, because I didn't share it. Sorry. Right. Let's see. How about now? Yeah. Okay. All right, so A is activation of antithrombin. Um, so what do you think is A? What, what drugs I'm talking about in A? Yeah, antithrombin, I think. Anyone, we talk about it. Heparin, why? Yep, so antithrombin is heparin. What about B? Yeah. B, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so uh, how does warfarin uh, work? Yeah, warfarin is anti vitamin K agents. Yeah, so but it, exactly what does it do to the vitamin K? So, so vitamin I K, so what does vitamin K do in terms of you know clotting factors? It helps the yeah. carboxylation, so uh, that's just yeah. another way to say yeah. you know, inhibit factor, vitamin K, so inhibit of the carboxylation of the clotting factors. Okay, what about C? What do you think C is? What block ADP? I think it's uh, Yep. Okay. Yep, so that's clopidogrel, uh, so we call it Plavix. And then uh, what about D? Oh, number five. Yeah, that's just random. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, what about E? Absisimab. Absisimab. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So uh, you, you got it right. So it's basically, you need to remember uh, the EKG pattern for AFib. Uh, so uh, it's because, you know, I could show you uh, like an EKG of AFib and then I would talk like, they, they can test you by that way, okay? They give you a, a, like an EKG of AFib, uh, but you know, they can also just write it out like it's irregularly irregular rhythm when you think about AFib and the patient present with palpitations. So very characteristic for AFib. So people uh, who is on AFib need to be uh, on anticoagulation. Uh, uh, so warfarin is, very, uh, is one of the drugs that they often give um, for anticoagulations. All right, so, so that is AFib. So instead of giving you the description, I can give you a strip of the AFib. Uh, so that's what, uh, what AFib look like. So it's irregularly irregular. And then remember the mechanism of warfarin. All right, so let's do uh, question three. Uh, so we have a 27 years old uh, female who is on a business trip to Asia and she presented to the ED with like, shortness of breath and tachycardia. Uh, she is generally healthy with no really past medical history. Uh, but unfortunately, she's a smoker and she, but she does not drink alcohol. Uh, she's taken oral contraceptive pills uh, on physical exam one of her legs is more swollen than the other. Uh, so the ED physician immediately started on a medication, which is the following the mechanism of this drugs. So what do you think the patient has? The first thing. <coughs> hey, do you know what uh, what she having? Um. D DVT. Okay. Well, DVT. Mm -hmm. And then, so DVT is where? Where does it occur? Different uh, thrombosis. Okay. Is that occur in the legs? No. Uh, it's the cut in the deep leg. Okay. Right. Okay. But why should I have a shortness of breath if it occurs in the leg? 
But the but the, the blood travel to the lung. Okay. So what do you call that then? Pulmonary, pulmonary edema, uh, embolism. Okay. So uh, pulmonary embolism. So what drug do you give when patient have pulmonary embolism? So, so you, it, uh, you need some uh, um, uh, uh, fibrinolysis, right? Yeah. Right. What do you think? I Anyone think knows? So someone who have a PE, what drug do you give in the hospital? Or you know, someone, someone in the hospital, what do you give uh, to prevent PE? It's very common. Um, you know, the patient always get a shot in the hospital. Heparin, right? Yeah, so heparin, exactly. So how does heparin work? And, uh, and um, activate uh, tr um, thrombin and factor uh, 5, uh, factor 10. Okay. Sorry, thrombin so, and uh, 10. Yeah, so it's actually, uh, you know, uh, activate antithrombin. So it's the antithrombin function is to inhibit factor 2 and factor 10, uh, which is help, you know, clotting. So, so the patient have uh, PE, pulmonary embolism. Uh, so you treat it acute uh, PE, you know, with heparin. And a lot of patients in the hospital uh, before, you know, they, after the surgery or uh, anyone who stay in the hospital for a long time who doesn't ambulate, you know, cannot walk around, they always give you the, sh you know, the shot of heparin. Uh, so if you go to the hospital next time, just pay attention. Uh, a lot of patients on that one. All right, so let's see some side effects uh, of the drugs. Okay, so uh, match this effect with the drugs. Uh, so aspirin. What's the side effect of aspirin? Anyone B. know? B, gastric bleeding, okay. All right, what about heparin? What's the side effect of heparin? Skin necrosis. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the side effects for heparin is actually reduction of platelets, more than 50% and thrombosis, and warfarin is a skin necrosis. Yeah, okay. HIT, right? Yeah, HIT, so they call HIT. Uh, okay, so what I want you guys to remember is basically this. You have to know the two important anticoagulation medications. So the first one is heparin. Uh, so they use for like acute anticoagulation treatments because these are short actins. Uh, so you need to remember the mechanism is activate antithrombin and they affect uh, the uh, PTT, which is the intrinsic pathway. And one of the side effect for heparin is they call heparin induced uh, thrombocytopenia uh, because of the, uh, you know, our body produces antibodies against the PF4 and it causes the platelets to actually uh, become activated and clump together. Uh, so it called the platelets to drop but at the same time, uh, your playlist are activated so that you, you know, uh, you have uh, clotins everywhere. And then warfarin, uh, just remember that it's used for long-term anticoagulations. Uh, so the mechanism is vitamin K inhibitors. Uh, so they block the carboxylation uh, of the clotting factors and protein C and protein S. And uh, warfarin, uh, remember it's effect, uh, factor 279 uh, so remember two, seven, so seven is an extrinsic pathway, so that's why it affects the PT. Uh, one of the side effects of warfarin is that it, it crosses the, um, um, the membrane uh, uh, of pregnancy, so that's why it's teratogenic, so that's why we don't use it in people who, uh, who are pregnant. Uh, so uh, pregnant, do not use warfarin. And then the other one is warfarin-induced uh, skin necrosis. Uh, do people know why uh, you get skin necrosis when you use warfarin? Uh, because it had, um, yeah, yeah, let, let, let someone let someone say it. Sure. Who wanna give it a try? Why? Why do we get skin necrosis? Um, um, for, because protein cell has half like more shorter than um, uh, crossing factor two, seven, nine, and ten. Mm -hmm. So when the person take uh, this drug, uh, protein C will uh, the 
the amount of protein C in the blood will reduce more than this. So uh, it will um, lose its effect on the crossing factors of the prison habits for. Okay, so when you give the uh, warfarin, uh, it blocks factor 2, 7, 9, uh, 10, but it's also block uh, protein C and protein S, right? But like you say, there's the half-life of protein C and S a lot shorter, uh, so that's why you end up uh, running out of protein C and S before you run out of the other factors. And protein C and S is required, uh, you know, it helps uh, with sort of, you know, uh, so anticoagulants, so if you run out of the anticoagulants, you sort of run into the problem of uh, forming clots, right? Yeah. Which defeat the purpose. Uh, you want the patient to have thin blood and now all of a sudden uh, the patient form clots. So that's why uh, they don't give warfarin right away, but you have to bridge it uh, with heparin until you get like a therapeutic uh, uh, range and then you start uh, warfarin. So that's why in the hospital, they always start patients on heparin and then they switch into uh, warfarin. Thank you. Yeah. So, so that's why I just want to see about HIT. Uh, so it's, it's very, not very common, but it's always tested on the exam. So the way they test it on the exam is that, you know, the patient come in, uh, you know, they started on the drugs. Uh, so usually the, uh, the condition that patient come in use a PE. Uh, so when you patient have PE, uh, the, you know, they will give heparin and then all of a sudden the next day when they test the blood, uh, the uh, uh, platelet is just dropped into a, like more than half, uh, but the patient doesn't really have any other symptoms uh, and they some, like sort of like uh, drop in platelets, but it's also forming clots everywhere. Uh, so that's how you know it's hit and, uh, you know, um, to treat it, you just stop the heparin. Okay, so the, uh, and then the next one is the warfarin-induced uh, skin necrosis. Uh, so this is a very characteristic uh, pictures of uh, warfarin-induced. So you see it's a hemorrhagic uh, sort of uh, necrosis. Uh, so you see all this black thing is actually blood underneath and then they form this bolus. Uh, so that's the reason why they always bridge, uh, you know, heparin uh, to warfarin. Uh, they don't start warfarin right away. Okay. All right, so that's all I have for you guys. Uh, uh, you know, so as this bleeding is very complicated and it's hard to like, uh, you know, stop everything in, in one lecture. Uh, so I just hope that, uh, my hope is that you guys just remember, you know, the objectives. Uh, so just make sure you know uh, the difference between primary uh, versus secondary hemostasis, uh, understanding, you know, the uh, um, normal endothelium, uh, what, you know, uh, what, factor they produce is to prevent uh, blood from clotting and then just know that when you know, when your endothelium is uh, injured uh, you know what factor is released to help uh, you know promote uh, blood clotting and then just remember uh, the the function of a platelet uh, remember all the structures on the platelets like the glycoproteins uh, the von Willebrand factors and then uh, the release of ADP because those are uh, targets for drugs uh, so you remember them uh, you will know how the drugs work. And then, uh, so for the, for the uh, coagulation factor, just remember like, you know, extrinsic factor is sub factor seven, and then everything else is uh, sort of like intrinsic factors. And just remember how uh, heparin and warfarin works. Uh, they are commonly tested. So you need to know uh, when do they use uh, warfarin, when do they use heparin, what the size effect of, of you know, heparin, side effect of warfarin. Um, and uh, just remember the, the PTT and then PT and then bleeding time. Um, so those are very commonly tested. And uh, uh, just remember the disease associated with uh, coagulation disease, uh, like hemophilia, uh, vitamin K deficiency. And then uh, remember the disease that associated with uh, platelet dysfunction, you know, like the uh, Vanessa Solia, uh, Klansman, uh, and then uh, von Willebrand disease. Okay, anyone have any questions? Okay, uh, thank you for the cases, uh, you know, that you guys present. Uh, I hope that you guys can present more cases because uh, it's actually a lot more fun when you uh, present like a real patient uh, because you learn a lot uh, from a real patient. Um, so uh, any feedback for the sections? Anyone want to talk?
at all. Okay, so uh, for the next section, uh, what do you guys want to, you know, like study or want to learn? Anyone have any idea? Okay, I would I would pick a topic and then um, we can you know have more cases. Uh, so uh, bleeding bleeding disorder is a little bit broad, so it's harder to uh, sort of you know go through. Uh, so for the next class, I will pick something a little more like easier so that uh, more people can have fun uh, learning. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Have a great night. Yep. Good night.